Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to my channel. We're going to do a video today talking about an article I saw called the, the Sugar Babies of Stanford University. And um, <laughs> yeah, obviously, you guys know I'll have a lot to say about that. But I just wanted to kind of give everybody an update about why I haven't been posting a lot right now. As you guys know, I am working on a documentary um, for the Whitmer fednapping hoax. And I was traveling to film for that. So that took a lot of time. It cost a lot of money. And um, then when I came back, uh, I, I've gotten very sick. Uh, I have the coof. So there's that. I've been very, very sick. I'm still very sick. I, I feel like terrible. <laughs> it's very bad. I've had a fever for days and I had to keep taking Advil and Tylenol. I haven't really been able to eat. It is just really not fun. And um, I'm still kind of recovering, but I did want to do a small video um, just to give you guys something since you haven't heard from me in a while. And then I'll get back into it probably, hopefully in a couple more days here as I start to feel better. Um, but anyways, if you do want to contribute financially to my work, if you want to help me out since I've been spending a lot of money um, on the documentary and it's going to cost a lot more money, there will be more traveling involved and I'll have to hire some people to help me edit it to get it done in a quickly manner. You can donate to me via Cash App. Uh, that's the best way to do it because YouTube takes a large percentage of the money and they also only pay you once a month. So I still haven't gotten paid for last month, which is weird. But anyways, that's the best way to support me. I also have a donor box um, and I'm on Locals. So I'll have all those linked in the video description if you want to help out and contribute to my work so I can keep doing this and do better things. But with that being said, um, this is just something that really it's it's not surprising to me. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all, but I think that maybe for some people it is surprising. I'll just show you guys, um, you know, one of the, there's two articles. This girl, Nicola uh, Burskirk wrote two of them. This is the second one she wrote. Uh, Why are elite co-eds turning to TikTok and Snapchat to connect with lonely men who pay for their attention? Less work, more money, passive income stream. And so right off the bat here, um, elite co-ed. So the, obviously the girls who are going to Stanford are part of the elite class. Um, they're not the kinds of people that are strapped for money. A lot of these girls have their parents parents paying for everything. So it's not like they need the money. So when you think about why they're doing it, um, pr probably validation and attention, um, number one, but uh, number two, they don't have class. Money does not equal class. That's something that um, I think everybody should know. If you don't know by now, you can't buy class. It's something that you have. And so for these women, I guess their price is that low, right? Um, that's how what how much they value themselves. And for the men, that's what they think they're worth also, apparently. Uh, it's just very sad and it, it cheapens everything. And this is such a problem. You know, simps and classless women are ruining our society. And it's so sad that there are men that are that lonely that they feel like they need to pay these vapid whores for attention. And I'm sorry, but that is what they are. If you don't like my language, you know, I guess deal with it. Um, but yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to just read some of this. The first article here, uh, the sugar babies of Stanford University. This one is from last month from overnight social media fame to sugar baby side hustles. America's elite young women are changing the rules of sex and class. That's how this author, Nicola, is framing this article. And it begins, 
the promise of sexual liberation was the freedom to love as we choose, and who could possibly stand opposed to so noble a position? No, sexual liberation was a lie, and it has harmed a great number of men and women. But decades after the unwinding of America's traditional sexual mores, a new morality has clearly emerged and young people increasingly find themselves navigating a culture of sexual anarchy in which, provided an act is consensual, there is no quote-unquote right or wrong. No, I mean, <laughs> I, you could say that that's been pushed on us culturally from the elites, yeah, they like that because it, it causes chaos and confusion and really strong families is something that they are opposed to. They, they want everybody to be serfs. They want everyone dependent on them. So, yeah, they're opposed to strong uh, Christian, traditional uh, families, um, self-sufficient people, independent people. That's the things that they are opposed to. So, of course, they want to cause this kind of sexual anarchy because they don't want people getting married and having children and having these strong families. You know, th that is the real opposition to their power and their control. So, of course, they're going to promote sexual degeneracy and call that freedom and empowerment. And it's the exact opposite. By the way, I will include the link in the video description. Uh, such thinking has brought us inevitably to the rise of OnlyFans, the normalization of sex work, and the curious story of Stanford University's sugar babies. Nicola uh, Burskirk is the founder of the publishing house LSR Books and is a filmmaker and director of upcoming documentary The Marriage Pact. She's a recent graduate of Stanford and she guests today with an investigation into the strange phenomenon of wealthy, extraordinarily well-connected young women on her campus turning to the world of sex for cash. So... You know, again, it, they're already saying that these women are wealthy and extraordinarily well connected. They are elite. So why, why do they need to do this? And it's something sick in their mind. It's a control thing. It's getting off on dominating and controlling other people. And I think that you'd be surprised the kinds of men that are paying these women for attention. It's not necessarily a wealthy older men like you might presume. Um, you know, you might think of something like this, but you also have a lot of blue collar guys spending their money simping for these kinds of disgusting women who don't care about them, who laugh at them behind their back and view them as nothing more than an ATM. And that is not good for men or women. So the article begins, it was fall at Stanford University and Cassie was going about a normal day of classes and clubs when on a whim, her friend pulled out her phone and started filming. She danced for the camera, probably provocatively, and pulled some jokingly sexual moves. No, come on, guys. Does anyone believe this was a joke? These women love attention. They knew exactly what they were doing. She is dancing provocatively and simulating sex acts. It wasn't a joke. A few mutual friends might see it on a private story, Cassie thought. They'd laugh along and that would be the end of it. Oh, please. But instead, Cassie's friend shared the video publicly and it went viral on social media. Within a few days, the video had been seen by millions of people. The reaction was overwhelming. The reaction was insane. The reaction presented an interesting opportunity for women who have no class or elegance. Cassie decided to embrace the virality and make more suggestive videos like the salute that she already inevitably is. Sometimes she danced in bikinis, sometimes she responded to indecent comments, and it wasn't long before men started asking Cassie if they could send her money. Right. You, does anyone think that we're not getting, like, all of the details here? Oh, it just accidentally happened. Whoops, the video just accidentally was made public instead of private. Hee <laughs> hee. Come on. They really think that we're stupid. Uh, so why not, she thought, and Cassie included a link to her cash app with her videos. Note, the videos have since been taken down. 
As the money started flowing in, so did messages from men interested in more than just a public video. You think? What do you think they're giving her money for? <laughs> for her to tip her for her publicly posted videos? Get real. From here, the business, which it had accidentally become, naturally expanded. Cassie started sexting with various men in exchange for money and eventually gifts. Cash, flowers, lingerie, a television, a tennis bracelet, a diamond ring. Her main sugar daddy, Pat, sent around $600 just to get her attention. When men asked for feet pics, Cassie declined and brought in a new friend, Lainey, to take her quote-unquote overflow customers. Oh, so it's almost like a pyramid scheme trafficking operation here, recruiting other girls to do the things you don't want to do. And it's pretty disgusting. And I feel bad for these men. These simps are ruining our society because you're taking these girls who are already wealthy and already probably incredibly vapid and narcissistic and arrogant, and then you're giving them money for nothing. For what value? What do they have to offer? Dancing around and publicly posting provocative and suggestive imagery? Like, is this supposed to be a good thing? And this woman here, uh, this lady pictured here with her sugar daddy, look at her holding the money um, on her face. Like, this is all these people care about. It's absolutely disgusting. And look at this guy. This dude ended up dying. He had a heart attack because he had diabetes and was incredibly morbidly obese. And after he died, she wrote a letter talking crap about him that she had published or something. And so she, th these women have no respect for these men. None. And it, it's just, it's so awful for society. It's just commodifying everything, the most intimate parts of yourself, right? You know, we are spiritual beings and God created us for certain reasons. He, Our bodies are our temples and we're supposed to, you know, protect it and treat it that way. These women are just giving this stuff away for free. The most intimate parts of them that should be kept for their husband or, you know, somebody that they love and they're giving it away for free, commoditizing everything. Everyone is now just a consumer and everyone, I guess, is for sale. And they're so cheap that, you know, a couple hundred bucks, they'll be willing to be intimate with you. Even if it's electronically, it doesn't matter. That's still the same thing. And it's so gross to me. The article continues, when one thinks of sugar daddies and sugar babies, the image of wealthy older men and a young guileless girl come to mind. Maybe we think of a man with salt and pepper hair and a gold Rolex. Maybe he has an ex-wife with a yacht somewhere or grandkids who spend the summer with him in the Hamptons. And maybe the girl in the scenario comes from more humble circumstances. She's a college student with perhaps a nice family who can't afford her tuition or phone bill or car payments or whatever. Maybe Maybe she's an aspiring actress whose sugar daddy funds her L.A. lifestyle when waitressing doesn't cut it. You get the picture. It's a scene from Pretty Woman, and the woman is somehow innocent, if not quite the hooker with a heart of gold. But while this image still sometimes maps to reality, the norm is changing. Yeah, and that's another thing. The vulnerable women that are preyed upon by older wealthy men, it's, it's not like Pretty Woman. That is a lie. They use these girls up, they take their best years, and then they discard them like trash. And these girls are end up scarred for life. <laughs> we never think of girls at elite universities with high-paying career prospects sugar babying for a taxi driver or night shift factory worker from a flyover state. Yet at Stanford, this is exactly the case. It also reflects a broader change in the sexual dynamics of American culture. Well, no, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because those guys normally can't get that kind of wealthy, uh, probably very attractive girl. So, of course, they'd be willing to pay for it. And these women don't care. They don't even need the money. It's the, the power trip, the ego uh, that they get from it, the ego boost. 
Sites like OnlyFans, popular among the pay-to-see-me-naked subset of gig workers, have entered the mainstream in recent years as millions of young women and men turn to it for supplemental income or to chase full careers. Over 170 million others subscribe as quote-unquote customers. Celebrities like Bella Thorne and YouTube's Karina Kampf, the well-known and highly paid OnlyFans creators, overshadow the reality for the vast majority of uh, for whom getting nude for strangers nets an average of only about $150 a month and 21 subscribers. So that's how much you think you're worth. You sell yourself for $150 a month. I'm sorry, but you get what you deserve. You don't value yourself. Why should anyone else value you? You have no class. You lower yourself to being less than the dirt on someone's shoe. That's your price. <laughs> but focusing on OnlyFans alone ignores the vaster, far more commonplace and socially acceptable enterprise of TikTok thirst traps. There's precious little data on the sheer volume of thirst traps posted by young women and often men, some of whom are clearly underage, on TikTok every day, let alone every month or year, save a few surprised forum posts. Every new TikTok viral song poses a new opportunity for Billion to be exact to be suggestive without being explicitly sexual which is often not the case with much OnlyFans content. But both OnlyFans and TikTok thirst traps have something in common, a personal touch that draws in viewers and money. Though neither Cassie nor Lainey set out to be sugar babies, right, their word for what they did, they had the foresight to set strict boundaries, right, I'm sure. Their sugar babying consisted of sexting, sexual voice recordings, and some suggestive but clothed Snapchats. They say there were no nudes, no phone calls, no meetups. They didn't publicize where they attended school, but people found out anyway and sent the above-mentioned gifts. When I asked them why they set these boundaries, Lainey replied, quote, it's not worth it to me to send someone nudes for a small amount of money when we literally go to Stanford and are going to make money off our intelligence. I would rather not send anything that could jeopardize my entire life in order to get like $20 or whatever it is. Then what are you doing? What are you really doing anyway? And how do you justify that? Her reasoning has a certain internal consistency. It also indicated the curious situation of my two classmates. They did not actually need the money they were making from taking advantage of vulnerable, lonely men. Their parents paid their tuition and health care. Cassie paid for her own phone bill. And both Cassie and Lainey, like most 21-year-olds, funded their own social lives. But prior to her social media fame, Cassie afforded these expenses by tutoring a few hours a week. Oh, actually working. As school and social life demanded more of her time, why did social life demand more of her time? No, it didn't. She chose to do that. She cut down her tutoring hours, and as her sugar babying brought in more money, she cut tutoring down more. Lainey put it simply, less work, more money, passive income. For them, sugar babying is a bit of entertainment and easy money that for now has virtually no consequences. No, it does, though. It does to the men they're taking advantage of. And this is the problem with simps also. They ruin it for everybody else. And these classless women ruin it for everyone else as well. They're destroying the entire dating uh, market for everybody. They're destroying male-female relations. This is the reason why men hate women right now. They think that all women are as disgusting as this. And this is the reason why women have no respect for men anymore. They think all men are cucks and bitches and betas like this. And so all around, it's a big, big problem. And it, it does have far-reaching consequences, not just for these people, but for society as a whole. 
Neither of the girls would like their families or employers to find out, but any social stigma that once existed around this kind of thing is long gone, and that is another huge problem. Their friends just laugh about it and often participate. It's a big game. It's a big joke to them. They have no respect for these men. They don't care about the feelings of the people that they're preying upon. The sexting, Cassie said, quote, could escalate to being really sexual, and that's when I'd pass it off to a friend. My friend thought it was so funny, so I'd just give him the phone for him to talk to the sugar daddy for a bit and hundreds of dollars would flow in. He can say whatever weird stuff he wants because it's not about him. So these dudes are communicating with other men. They think that they're talking to these girls. That's the other thing. You're, you're sexting with a dude and you're paying for it while everyone's sitting there laughing at you. Have some respect. When I spoke to other students at Stanford about the sugar baby phenomenon, a few raised eyebrows at potential quote-unquote safety concerns. This is, of course, the only objection to sex work you are allowed to have as a good progressive feminist on a college campus. This is the problem. You give women so-called freedom and liberation, and they destroy themselves and everything else around them. It, it really is sad. What if these men show up to the house where Cassie and Laney and dozens of other students live? What if they want more than online transactions and come to stalk, kill, kidnap, or rape the girls? Oh, sorry. <laughs> you have to leave that out. Fortunately, nothing like this ever occurred. And the men, like Pat, were respectful of Cassie's refusing their offer for a visit. But this brings us to the collateral damage not often named in these stories. While the girls come out more or less unscathed, what about the men? You think they care? In truth, Cassie and Lainey don't know much about their clients. They didn't bother to find out because they truly don't care. They can't be bothered to learn even the, little, the littlest bit about someone they're being intimate with. Some are older with grandkids, some are in their 20s, one is an attorney, but most of the men they told me are a working class, a taxi driver from Kentucky or a factory worker. Pat, the taxi driver from Kentucky, sent Cassie money for sex and bought her drinks when she was out with friends. Then he started sending gifts. He never asked for pictures, sexual or otherwise. Their conversation started out normal before getting more intimate. A few times he asked to fly out to Stanford and visit her, so she cut off her relationship. Yeah, she just cut him off whenever he did, when, when he suggested that they get closer after she was reeling him in and you know, getting this guy to be vulnerable with her, who is obviously lonely and desperate. Even though he worked multiple jobs at his older age, Cassie guessed he was 60 or 70, Pat at least seemed to have the means to make the trip. He paid her nearly $600 before their first conversation and more throughout their interactions afterward, but David worked the night shift at a car manufacturing plant, and he was always broke. He could only pay the girls on Fridays when he got his paycheck, and these women don't need money, and they take the money anyway, knowing that these guys are broke and they can't afford it. What is wrong with them? Despite this, he consistently spent quite a bit of money for Lainey to send feet pics, only the bottom of the feet, and crucially, to tell him he was a loser, his pee-pee was small, and send me money. So he liked to be dominated by a gross woman. What do you... Ah... The mismatch between his income and spending worried the girls enough they considered intervening, but ultimately decided, no, they'll just take the money anyways, because they don't care. There were many others along the same lines in their situations, including relationships with the girls, told the same rather sad story. The men were searching for a personal, intimate relationship with a woman. The best they could do, however, was this strange online transaction. It's called a parasocial relationships. Porn or e even OnlyFans would probably be easier than finding random pretty girls on social media to sex if the sexual aspect were the only things that mattered, but it's clearly not. It's the personalization that makes Cassie and Lainey worth the money in this way. The men in the story seem to use them as self-medication for the dire situation many working-class American men find themselves in today. 
While college-educated and upper-class Americans still enjoy relatively stable marriages, poor and increasingly working-class Americans face rising rates of family instability, single parenthood, and lifelong singleness. Since the 70s, as offshoring moved countless American jobs overseas with little to replace them, less educated American men have suffered greater rates of unemployment while college-educated men do not. How about suicide? The link between education and stable employment means less educated men are now less marriageable. Women marry up, not down. Hypergamy. So, bachelorhood and divorce is prevalent for these men. Such circumstances lead men to a life of unemployment, dysfunction, and loneliness. More and more, this leads to other mental health and substance abuse issues. But they're still men. This makes them invisible. Women, meanwhile, have had a century of success if doing a lot more work outside the home, marrying later and less frequently, and having fewer children is counted as success. Yeah, it's not. The feminist movements of the 20th century thrust upper and upper middle class women from their traditional roles as wives and mothers, economically dependent on men, as they should be, into the political sphere of men, then into the corporate sphere, again, of men, for the sake of political then economic dependence from men. Along with entrance into the workforce, women slowly dominated the universities. As of 2021, women made up 60% of all U.S. college students. Men, meanwhile, made up 71% of the overall enrollment decline over the last five years. It's simple supply and demand. When you have increasingly more women than men taking spots in elite circles, institutions, and companies, you have a significant mis mismatch of viable partners for both women and men, men similar to the ones paying Cassie and Lainey. This is how it destroys the entire society. You know, it's not empowerment for anybody, especially not women. As a young woman myself, part of me had the same reaction as a lot of my friends when I first heard the story through the Stanford grapevine. I questioned the girl's safety and was disgusted with the gross, old, lecherous men getting what they wanted from young, pretty girls. But the more I talked to Cassie and Lainey, the more I learned about the men who were paying them. This wasn't a simple story. I had been fed time and time again of privilege and power. In fact, it was closer to the opposite. Our men are not okay. Only this complete upheaval of traditional gender dynamics could allow high-achieving women to sugar baby from working-class men without any tangible consequence to the women. Cassie and Laney's experience is a microcosm of the broader cultural changes in America over the past few decades. American men, especially working-class men, have been left behind with little hope for the quote-unquote American dream of a good family, stable job, income, and community. Yeah, of course. It's very sad. Um, and this is why suicide and depression are such a big thing. It's also why men are going their own way and giving up on dating altogether because in their minds, it's simply not worth it. And a lot of these women, they'll marry a man and then they'll leave him and they'll take half of everything he has and he will be paying them for the rest of their lives, uh, for the rest of his life. It's very, very sad, and it's c very unfair. And um, I honestly don't know what can be done about it. Rather, they self-medicate with drugs, alcohol, porn, and the pseudo-personal relationships offered by girls like Cassie and Lainey. Although the girls seem to be doing well while the men suffer, the girls dis describe the constant objectification with some queasiness. And yet they're still doing it. No one's forcing them to do it. But both sides, the girls and men paying them, benefit from the objectification of the other. At least on the surface, the girls, by profiting from the man's isolation and dire circumstances, and the men by sexualizing the girls. One perhaps is not worse than the other, but neither is worth celebrating. It, but the thing is, though, and this author admitted it earlier in the article, the, the men weren't looking for sex so much as they were connection and companionship. They, when the girls said no to, they weren't even sending these guys nudes. You know, it's so sad to me. This entire thing just really disgusts me. And, um, you know, I, I'd like to hear what you guys think about this in the comments below. Is this what you were thinking of? You know, this scenario when I first showed you this image here, um, I'm and it's called it Stanford Sugar Babies. I'm sure this is exactly what you were thinking, right? Rich older men and these girls. 
uh, but that's not the case. It is working class guys and not all of them old. I mean, there's a lot of young men who who can't get a woman or whatever for whatever reason or the women that they have gotten are nasty and mean to them and they want some kind of connection with somebody and to feel like someone cares about them, to feel like they matter to somebody. And, um, you know, I think it's just terribly heartbreaking. And I think that things are going to continue to get worse, you know, and this is the problem when you uh, take, when you create the so-called sexual liberation and you remove consequences from things like this, right? And it's very damaging. There are a lot of women who ran around acting like sleuths uh, for, you know, 10, 15 years, racking up a massive body count, and then they're miserable. They, you know, those guys that they would go out and sleep with would never call them back or didn't want a relationship with them. And that's hurtful. And then for the men, they didn't realize the consequences of their actions. You know, women can't just run around having one night stands like men. We're not like that. It's we're we are wired very differently. Um, so women think that they can act like men in the sexual marketplace without consequence. And it isn't true. It is incredibly damaging for them. And then you have all these women with all this trauma and baggage. And then you have men that feel guilty because they didn't understand what they were, how they were hurting these girls, you know, by using them like that. You know, they maybe they thought it was the mutual uh, exploitation or whatever. But it, it really isn't, and it has. A, it's very damaging to society as a whole. And so I think that what has to happen, and I don't know how we get here, is that we have to go back to the way things were before the so-called sexual revolution, where women uh, are women and are in the home being mothers, caretakers, you know, uh, good companions, loving, um, nurturing people. <laughs> being women, you know, it's shocking, right? Uh, not having to compete with men in, in the workplace and act like men, that's another funny thing. Uh, and men act like men. But and the thing is, is that you can't demand that women be traditional and feminine, but you're not willing to commit to them. If you expect a woman to be a homemaker and to be traditional and feminine, then you have to be an actual man. You have to commit to her and take care of her like you're supposed to. You have to be in your own dominant role and you have to lead and guide not just her, but your family. If you're going to expect women to be traditional and feminine, then you have to be dominant and you have to lead. Sorry, that's just how it is. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And that's something that pisses me off about these men in the so-called red pill community, um, that they have all of these demands and they claim that women have a list, a, a checklist of demands for men that they want. But you guys have the same checklist. So you have to make it make sense. If you want women to go back to being more traditional and feminine, then you have to be willing to um, commit to women. You can't just go your own way, right? You have to be willing to do those things also. You have to be more traditional as well. Um, anyways, I don't know how we fix this, but I think that that would be one way uh, to start trying to fix it is to go back to, you know, how God made us and how God intended our relations to be. And that is how God intended men and women to be. He wanted men to have authority and to be the head of the household, to have headship over the family, and for women to be the man's helper and companion, to be nurturing and loving, caring, receptive, and warm, to provide a sort of sanctuary for that man when he comes home in his household to take care of him while he is out there working, providing, leading, and guiding. And she should defer to his authority, but he should also respect her and her wisdom and the strengths that she does have as a woman. So anyways, this is longer than I thought it would be. I'm feeling really bad again, so I'm going to go probably rest. Um, I still think I'm in the midst of a fever. Guys, the coof is real. <laughs> 
it's real and it doesn't feel good. Anyways, this video is probably going to be demonetized like all of the other ones, but I hope you all enjoyed it. And hopefully, hopefully I will be recovering soon and I will have more stuff for you guys shortly. Whee!